So uh, just a quick recap, how did it start? Uh, Dieter and um, Harald, I'm told, started on the BS11 ABIS project, or uh, just trying to get some uh, BS11 uh, BTS to work for them. And it continued to BSC hack and on to open bsc.git. And that's all that basically I gathered from the preface of the Osmocom manuals because I wasn't there yet. I joined at this third stage, openbsc.git was the hub of Osmocom cellular network infrastructure. And uh, basically it is, uh, was as simple as this. You have some BTS and um, the Osmo NITB program, which had um, um, a subscriber database based on SQLite. So, uh, simply enough, and uh, just keep this image in mind for later, <laughs> because it's going to change a lot. Uh, so, it's obviously not that simple. There is also the packet switch site, the SGSN, and um, so what springs to mind already is that the SGSN had some uh, GSUB protocol to proxy to a map. And this is, of course, for the subscriber database. GSUB is uh, an, an Osmocom invention that's sort of a simplified map. And uh, it started out meaning GPRS, subscriber update protocol. And uh, so it's obvious here that we have separate subscriber databases between NITB and SGSN, and uh, that's, uh, that's a problem, or that's not very nice. And the SGSN also used to have, like, accept all policies and stuff like that, but what we really want is um, ciphering uh, keys, like authentication and ciphering keys, um, tokens managed once for both. So um, the obvious step, so this is not necessarily in chronological order, it's just a logical breakdown of what it ended up being. Um, but I think this is even pretty much chronological. The um, HLR was the first split off from the NITB, a common subscriber database, the home location register. So um, the GSUB no longer means GPRS subscriber update protocol, it means generic subscriber update protocol. <laughs> and uh, so this was still an open bsc.git working on a branch. Uh, we had a um, separate home location register and a proper um, VLR inside the NITB. So at this stage already we have three key new features. So we have this common home location register. We have asynchronous communication with the subscriber database before the NITB process would stop, look up subscriber data, and then go on so we could technically block. And uh, the HLR also brought the support for millenage um, authentication tokens, also known as AKA. UMTS AKA. <laughs> so AKA, the capital ones means, uh, geez, now I forgot, authentication and key exchange algorithm. What? Key agreement. Key agreement, that's it. And the small one means also known as. <laughs> right, so what we also wanted was 3G. And um, so the HNB here denotes a, a 3G cell. Um, actually, it more accurate would be the home node B gateway, the HMB GW. But uh, so here we have the NITB, which is a BSC and an MSC together, and an SMSC and whatnot. So where do you plug it to? We have this ABIS, which is sort of outside of the BSC, so that's not a nice place to uh, add 3G support. So somewhere we need to put this IUCS, and um, basically then it was obvious that we need to cut the NITB in half and the, the parts that were BSC and MSC would have to be separate. Um, and also um, obvious was that we also still had the Osmo BSC, a separate program using only the BSC part of the NITB to talk SCCP Lite to a third party MSC. So um, 
we kind of have a BSC, a separate one, but we only had the MSC and BSC, so no separate MSC. So it made sense to, you know, rearrange it a little bit to this. So this looks already quite different. Um, um, we still have the HLR on the left and the BT uh, on the right and the BTS on the left. And now we have a separate Osmo BSC and we taught it to talk A interface to the MSC. And uh, the Osmo MSC program still has the MSC and the VLR like before. It was, uh, it was actually omitted here in the NITB circle. We had the MSC, the SMSC and the VLR. Um, the 3G Home Node B has a proper connection point, IUCS to the MSC. And um, same goes for the SGSN. And now on the bottom, you might have noticed what was previously the Osmo BSC talking SCCP Lite. It now became the Osmo BSC dash SCCP Lite to uh, indicate that it's the legacy Osmo BSC. This SCCP Lite one is still an open BSC.git and the proper one that we want to be supporting and using from now on is an open dash BSC.git. Uh, let's just add, uh, ah, okay, so what we have here now is 3G support. We have a proper true A interface and uh, that means we can also interface to third party MSCs. Um, over SCCP over M3UA, which is the proper 3GPP specified way of doing A interface. So um, just quickly, the Git repositories for later reference, I guess. So the osmobsc.git, osmoioh.git. Well, basically, it should illustrate that now it's not open bsc.git, but it's lots of separate Git repositories and their own separate projects going on independently. Uh, and the SCCP Lite one's still in the old open bsc.git. So that's what it really looks like now. Um, quite different from the beginning. What so far I didn't mention was the media gateway, which we pair up with the MSC and also the BSC now to route RTP streams. Before we used to do that internally. And uh, also, I didn't mention the STP, some, yeah, what is it? It's just a quite trivial, well, not so trivial, but conceptually quite trivial routing between SCCP point codes. So everything subscribes with the STP and then they can talk to each other, sort of like an IP network uh, subscribing at DHCP, something like that. Um, yes, so that's what we uh, have these days when we set up an Osmocom network. It's no longer NITB and you're done. Um, and recently I have I tested some backports to the old Osmo NITB and I was uh, pleasantly reminded of the simplicity <laughs> the whole setup had back then. But of course the features we have now justify this complexity. Like again, we have um, asynchronous uh, subscriber database access, proper millenage support. We can have 3G in there, interoperability with third party MSCs, and we can test each part on its own. So um, speaking of tests, if you don't have tests, testing everything, and you change everything in your code, like what do you get? What's the obvious conclusion? Uh, we got it, um, well, quite obviously on 34C3 last December, where we set up a GSM network. So we used the split components the first time, we added 3G to it, and uh, it was a complete disaster, like the MSC crashed like every 15 minutes, and uh, I mean, it was kind of working and, uh, you know, people came in, I can't subscribe, or oh, now I can call, and, and you know. but really it was far from stable. And even like going into setting up the network, I thought about a few things. Oh, hmm, uh, there was something about paging. Have I fixed that? Oh, no, I haven't fixed it. Better fix it before the Congress. And, you know, stuff, you know, stuff got concrete and it, was obviously broken. And uh, why? Because we didn't have proper testing. 
So um, I'm not sure at which point uh, Harald really started, but uh, I think the this uh, Congress disaster really got the TTC and three testing going that he started on. TTC and three, we'll have a talk on that as well, and um, uh, tomorrow morning I hear. And that's what really really need to get everything stable. So um, we take complete programs, input messages, and get messages back, and um, you can run it in Docker images. And already we uncovered a lot of bugs, and we're fixing them. Uh, and when it's a lot of work, also, but when we're through it, then we can be confident that it's reasonably stable, and we've come back to Osmo NITB stability despite all the new features and having ripped out its guts and reassembled it in different ways. So um, the, um, the unintended bugs aside, there's also some things that obviously are different now. Um, for example, the um, Oh, uh, th that's still a bit unintended. That I was already on the next slide here. So the 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 mes feed um, feature in NITB used to put measurement reports to a third program for uh, analysis, and um, while splitting the MSC from the BSC, that got lost because though it belongs in the BSC, it was the code was in libmsc, which didn't matter in the NITB because it's all one. Um, but they're not knowing really what it was. I just sort of deleted it and forgot about it. And then later it dawned on us, wait, what, it's gone? Where, where is it? And uh, so now it's a, still an open task to re-add it to the Osmo BSC. I started, but uh, in the daily uh, work, I haven't completed it yet. So um, we need to re-add. Um, feeding measurement reports to programs. Currently, A53 has a problem uh, because now we do it properly, uh, we broke it. <laughs> so uh, before, we didn't really check whether the, so the phone supports A53 or not. We just assumed if the network configures A53, then, well, let's use it. But uh, now we actually try to check the class mark that the subscriber sent and see, well, does it support A53? And if not, then don't use A53. Um, the thing, though, is that this class mark that indicates A53 is not part of the standard location updating message. So when the subscriber comes in, it sends the class mark 2, I think, which doesn't contain this indicator. It only goes up to uh, A51 and the obsolete A52, I think. And uh, so we never know whether A53 is supported from the MS or not because we don't have this class mark version present. And since we don't have the information, we assume that A53 is not supported. And so currently we completely thwart A53 configs in the MSC. Um, obviously what we need to do is, um, oh, do I have it on a slide here? No. Uh, I've got it later. So basically, the MSC needs to ask the subscriber for the proper class mark in a separate communication and then assert whether to use A53 or not. It's not very difficult, just need, someone needs to do it. And uh, I'm not sure about the state of external MNCC. I just recently heard that it's not, uh, wasn't working properly, but also I heard that it might be fixed. Maybe we can hear something on that later. Right, now the planned uh, or the obvious changes. Um, since the MSC is separate from the BSC now, we can't know which logical channel or which time slot on which BTS we are using for which subscriber on which call. So before on the NITB, we could show a summary of this uh, phone number or this MC is using currently for this call is the BTS 1 and uh, time slot 2 and uh, sub slot whatever 0 and uh, this information is no longer available in one place. The, the MC and the phone number is mostly in the MSC and the L chains and BTS structs are in the BSC and if we wanted to show them in one 
comprehensive view, we would need to add, um, or the plan is actually to add um, Osmocom specific tag level value pairs, like uh, information elements on our A interface that are only sent when both sides are Osmocom, so that we can uh, collate that information again. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's basically the same thing. The BSC, it basically gets um, channel requests or assignment requests, which naturally never, like usually never actually see what, what the IMSI is or the phone number is. And uh, though, so though the BSC pipes all that DTAP and uh, complete level three messages back and forth, it shouldn't really look at them, but of course we can. So one plan of mine is to, um, well, actually we also have some filter in there, some old feature that uh, unpacks these messages and gets the MC and phone number, well, I'm not sure about the phone number. I mean, they, anyway, the MC and the TIMC, so uh, my plan is to get them, read them out of there and put them back in the state. So in the logs, we don't need to say, well, a subscriber is unknown, but say this Altran is used by this MC currently. So uh, th that could be quite useful. Yes. Uh, well, it will sometimes be the Timsey, and uh, so, yeah, for example, if we page for a Timsey, then we will only get the Timsey from the MSC, or if the subscriber comes and it has a Timsey and does location updating with the Timsey from last time, we will only have the Timsey. That's why I also put the TLVs in there, so we might even want to tell the BSC about the actual MC, or maybe even the phone number, or... Yes, yes. Yeah, so there's some, uh, well, it's not very complicated work, but, you know, it needs to be put in place. And uh, sort of the same thing for the IMEI. Uh, no, it's not same at all. Uh, the IMEI is uh, not known by the network normally unless it asks for it with an identity request, and we have all the parts in place for it in the VLR, we, ha we have the messages and everything. The only thing that's missing there is the actual switching on. So it's off by default, and we don't have config items for it yet. So uh, all we need to do is add like three flags to the config, and then we would have the IMEI back like we uh, used to in the NITB, which used to, I think, ask for the IMEI by default always. And um, I wonder if it's on this slide. Oh yes, and then the IMEI, it would also make sense to pass it on to the HLR so that uh, you can look at the data in one place. And that's also some use case that uh, Keith brought to my attention of Rizomatica where in, in Mexico where they have someone showing up with a phone and they have no idea what their MC is but the IMEI is usually available on the phone information. So if you subscribe and uh, scan the logs for the IMEI, you can easily find out the, the MC without taking out SIM cards and doing stuff like that. So uh, that would be a useful feature for open communal networks. Um, mm -hmm, okay, so... so so uh, uh, Alexander said it's extremely useful to say what, to have the IMEI and the HLR in commercial networks for statistics. Um, so uh, I wonder if I should mention it here. Like um, the use case I mentioned now with someone showing up with the phone and, subs and subscribing and seeing an IMEI is uh, it also contains the subscriber create on demand thing where you sort of allow anyone to show up on your network. But one thing about that is that, of course, then you don't have uh, AKA um, authentication and ciphering tokens. So for allowing anyone on the network, you would have to not use any authentication nor encryption. And, uh, well, thinking further into it, we could possibly, you know, uh, 
ask for the IMEI and then reject the subscriber because we don't have data. But you know, this use case is still sort of intricate. Uh, if you want to have a secure network, then you shouldn't allow it. But if you want to find out the IMEI, you know, you, they, things can be done there. But currently, you don't have the IMEI and all. That's why it's on this slide. Uh, oh, there it is, the subscriber create on demand. So we have issues for all of these. If you open the slides, it's actually a link also on the pre-talks. You can also click on the, the issues and uh, take a look at their current state, if you so desire. Right, um, plans and ideas, like what, what should also come here besides stuff that we broke or uh, deliberately excluded. Um, so far we had the separate Osmo BSC SCCP Lite, like the legacy Osmo BSC. And of course we don't want to carry on backporting features to the old Osmo BSC forever. So what we need is SCCP Lite support in the new Osmo BSC, so that you can uh, benefit from the new features and still follow the old uh, architecture. And uh, I'm not so sure about Osmo BSC NAT that still lives in OpenBSC.git and it's quite um, excluded or idle in the new Osmo BSC. It's certainly not operational. And um, it's also a kind of a special program. Yes, so, so the question is the SCCP Lite for third-party MSCs. Um, so there are MSCs around that don't actually have a true A interface. So some uh, users still require the SCCP Lite. <coughs> <coughs> so um, moving to the new Osmo BSC is not easily possible there. Oh yeah, we actually have a mic for questions. It's a bit more formalized with video recordings, isn't it? Like last year, we would just talk into the room. Transcoding in the Osmo MGW, like that's been a long standing thing. I noticed this when I uh, implemented dynamic time slots, where um, I had a network that. Um, well, it's not necessary for the first time, but for me, for the first time, I had a network that by definition had both TCHF and TCHH time slots available. And then what I noticed is that it didn't work. Why? Because for some reason, the first phone doing the call came in on TCHF and assigning the, the MT call leg always assigned TCHH. So then, Always I had this TCHF, TCHH mismatch between the two phones and the call could never get established because we don't do transcoding. And um, the solution, well the workaround there for me was to allow a configuration switch to well, basically switch off TCHF with Osmocom dynamic time slots so that you always use TCHH but of course we want to be flexible on that. So at some point we need some sort of transcoding. Yes? Another solution might be to use, lower <laughs> solution might be to, uh, uh, use uh, lower modes of AMR, but that's uh, also, uh, that's, that's possible, does not require transcoding, but this requires AMR support in the phones, which is supposedly now supported by all modern phones. Yeah, well, it's, it's supposedly ubiquitous, but um, of course that's, uh, configuration question like we still want to allow tchf for legacy phones and tch and or basically we, we want to stay open to all the codecs and all the the legacy stuff and the new stuff and um, also thinkable would be to um, like we do now uh, have late assignment and choose the matching channel type but uh, for other reasons that I'm not going to go into, having transcoding in the MGW would be desirable and solve a lot of things. 
uh, I presume also with 3G interop and all that. So far, um, we still have a database in the Osmo MSC. It used to be the, sub the subscriber database, and now it's only the SMS database because SMS is still inside the MSC. And uh, we've been trying to get rid of the libdbd dependency for a long time, and, and in the HLR we're using SQLite directly now. And this SMS database is still tagging along and keeping libdbd in there. Uh, having deprecation warnings in our builds because of that. Um, right, another nice idea was the Osmo Network Check tool uh, that given the complexity, it's like a completely new uh, thought, given the complexity of the network now, have some program that is able to find out which components are working and which aren't and like telling you where communication stops and uh, uh, if something is wrong, or maybe even help you configure, uh, that so far it's still just a, an empty idea, no concrete code yet, it's just an issue number there. And also recently there's been talk on simplifying the, the new split components. For example, have, uh, don't have the STP in the middle, but incorporate it in the MSC, and uh, operate without an MGW, like in the old days, uh, like without a media gateway, and stream the RTP directly. So, um, yeah, well, uh, I'm pretty sure I forgot some things here, so um, if you can think of other use cases that are important in the NITB that you may, may notice aren't possible or have seen that aren't working anymore in the split components, Let's talk in the coming days about it. Um, otherwise, I'm through. I'm, this is my BSS map A interface release request. <laughs> so are there any questions? <laughs> you can just it keep the mic. <laughs> Uh, is accept uh, all modes supported in split architecture right now? Because I remember seeing some uh, issues in the tracker regarding it, be not it being not supported. Are you sure the mic is on? It's the yeah, it's on. Okay. Say again, is the what supported? Accept the all mode. Accept old mode? Accept all. all. Accept all mode. Oh, yeah. the accept all subscribers. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's uh, that's a good one. I forgot. It's it doesn't exist currently. So the it's kind of like the subscriber create on demand. Um I think in the SGSN you can still configure it like in the old uh, days and bypass the HLR, but the MSC needs an HLR to accept subscribers now. But is there any issue to like I mean is there any ideas how to get it back? Well, that would be a new feature to the HLR, basically. So the HLR gets the GSUB request for location updating, and we could add a feature that creates a new database entry as soon as it receives that. But so far, the HLR doesn't do that. So uh, it's, it's, I guess it's a uh, fairly trivial thing to add if it's really needed. It's, it shouldn't be too complex. Um, actually, probably you can even do without uh, an HLR uh, database entry. You can just simply send an accept back mm. or do an insert subscriber data with some random number or whatever, um, or without an MSI and ever. What, what, I mean, it depends on what the use case is, but uh, it's, it's definitely an HLR feature. Um. But you also need to assign a phone number, basically. <laughs> well, it depends on the use case, of course. Right. Uh, so then, release command, <laughs> release complete. <laughs> RSLD, no, RLSD. Yeah, okay, I'm released, thank you. <laughs> RLC is then your response. Is it? Yeah. Release clear. It's a pleasure.